Good evening, everyone. Hi, how are you doing tonight? Welcome to a new episode of uh, the Entrepreneur's Kitchen. Um, we had a last minute change of plans and I am so happy that I can host Johannes Grenzfortner, Professor Johannes Grenzfortner, uh, who is not only a professor, but also a filmmaker, an author, and uh, a multi-talented uh, um, nerd <laughs> is joining me tonight uh, at my kitchen and at his operation kitchen, right? Uh, hello, Professor Grensford. Now, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing very well. It's uh, wonderful to be connected to you, the wonderful marvels of the internet. <laughs> now we can enjoy them. I'm very happy that you're here in my operation room. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, we will hopefully have a pleasant and interesting conversation and also do some cooking. Uh, yes, it looks like you have washed your hands really properly. They are very shiny and white. How are your hands doing tonight? <laughs> My hands are actually doing fine. I counted. I washed them 47 times today. Uh, I have to say I was out there on the street today. Uh, you, you, because you, you, you went I outside? It. I went outside. I haven't been outside in four days. Today I went outside because I needed a very special ingredient uh, for my little little dish tonight. And that special ingredient, I didn't have it at home. I needed <laughs> coke. So I had to go outside to the spar, almost kill myself in the process, but now I have coke. Yeah. No, <laughs> you know, better to have coke than not to have coke nowadays. Nope. Nope. <laughs> so, nope. Well, Johannes, so I mean, uh, you are one of the really most multifaceted people we got to know, and I'm, I, I count myself as a very lucky person to get <laughs> to know you. Um, so let's talk about um, your nerdiness and how this all came together in your kitchen. But before we do that, well, um, I mean, speaking about nerdiness, so let's take him out. <laughs> uh, I have a giant Darth Vader pet spinner. You know, like, look at that. That's that. That's actually pretty lame, nerdy, I have to say. <laughs> Although you don't say lame because that's ableist. But uh, oh, okay. So yeah, we have to we have to check we have to watch our language, Mister. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah um, but but I mean, yeah, the, the question is a good one. Uh, so so I'm I'm a very nerdy person. I've been for for a long time. I think I do not know. An existence uh, before being a nerd. Uh, the interesting thing is that that the term itself, I only learned that when I was like 13 or 14 years old. So I didn't know that term nerd exists because that term never made it uh, from the U.S. Uh, to to Austria. And even in the U.S., I mean, the first time that the term nerd really starts popping up in, in popular culture is in the mid 70s. So pretty much around the time I was born, around 1975, is also the first time that people actively use the term nerd. Uh, of course, not meaning anything nice, but I think that <laughs> nerd, nerd is a really interesting figure, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a recent figure, uh, because the nerd is a very obsessive person. It's a person that is super much into a specific topic that could be like computers or uh, birds, eggs, or whatever it is, or, or Superman comics or whatever it is. But uh, there is this strange creature in the nerd. It's the, the nerd wants to know everything, but at the same time, the nerd knows that the nerd is extremely deficient. So the obsession <laughs> is about wanting to know more and more and more and more. And also being kind of like the know-it-all. So like nerds like to battle with other nerds about who knows more about a specific kind of topic. Yeah. And for me, <laughs> my nerdiness, I like my nerdiness because uh, in recent years, there has been a lot of debate about, you know, like white privilege and privilege of, of dominant yeah. mainstream culture and all that stuff. And in the meantime, nerd culture is mainstream. There is no debate about it. I it's mean, like most billionaires is, have been nerds. Yeah. Sure. As, <laughs> like the people of my generation are running the world now. Yeah. Like back in the 70s and 80s, nerds were kind of like beaten up in mm -hmm. high school, you know, like uh, just for being nerds. And 
the revenge like, of the nerds is so to speak the 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 hyper capitalism <laughs> that we, we have around here i mean we have people like like bezos running the world and and and, and well, Zuckerberg. He's the, he's the, i think he's the wealthiest person in private yeah. pri wealthiest yeah, yeah. private person trillionaire um, trillionaire absolutely. Oh, well, that's <laughs> Yeah. So it's like, you know, um, um, I, I remember watching Social Network, the movie, um, yeah. and it was like, you know, you can't get laid, so you just go and do something. That's yeah. really... I, think, I think the Social Network is probably one of the best films ever made about nerds and nerd culture, mm -hmm. because what it really talks about is the toxic element of nerd culture, the toxic mm -hmm. element also of, of, of masculinity, because I mean, pretty much the story is about a guy who wants a girlfriend and doesn't get the girlfriend and in the end kind of like creates Facebook and uh, yeah. and all <laughs> these like weird elements you have to that kind of like underdog culture. So this, the thing is like at the same time, I grew up as a nerd, but I also grew up, grew up uh, in a certain way of being part of punk subculture. So like mm -hmm. my, my upbringing was when I was born in 75, when I was 10 years old in 85, uh, that was like the heyday of the Cold War. I mean, younger mm -hmm. people will not be able to remember that. But I mean, in the meantime, with Corona outside lurking, <laughs> uh, we have a feeling of that again nowadays. But back then, yeah. I remember in elementary school in Austria, we had drills nuclear blast is happening <laughs> go under your table and hide under your table and yes. i remember that vividly wait but i was the last wait, wait, generation wait, 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 wait. that now grew up with to, this now you have to tense. go to your kitchen now you have to go to your kitchen shelf and you have to yep. grab three ingredients that uh oh. you're going to be using <laughs> exactly this is a cooking it's show <laughs> why would i go to the kitchen? i prepared them i prepared it already here look at that Look what I have here. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Look at this. Perfect. <laughs> ah, okay, so what do I have? What do we have? <laughs> I have, as mentioned before, Coca-Cola. <laughs> I think we're not allowed to do uh, uh, advertisement. <laughs> well, I mean, there is no way not knowing Coca-Cola. So there cannot be any advertisement for Coca-Cola. Uh, <laughs> Because it's like the most dominant uh, like brand Average. on the planet, like besides you know, like the cross or something, you know. Yeah. Okay, and then we have soy sauce. Okay. Uh, it's actually bio soy sauce from Spa. <laughs> well, that but, definitely uh, was I'm not, advertisement. Like, I'm not really like that kind of like bio person. I just like it. <laughs> yeah, it's. it's I'm. I'm Honestly, I don't like it, but it's the only soy sauce I have at home. So it's yeah. like it I have a, I have okay. a I have a request. So, and wait a second, what wait a I second. Have here is number three. Yeah. Um can you switch that HD off of your video? Because <laughs> I sure can. Uh, because oh then God, I think we might get to, a better better internet want connection the, to you. You want the, the you want to uh, to, to pixelize me. Is well, it? you know, pixels so, are nerdy, so it's, yeah, perfect, because now we have a better connection. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and the third ingredient is It's interesting, is because turning off, the, turning off the HD makes me look like, like a 1970s, uh, like, blurry sex film, you know, like uh, <laughs> Hamilton-like or something. It, it looks very, I don't know, <laughs> anyhow. So, third ingredient. Third ingredient presented on this wonderful little plate is a piece of meat. That's a tiny it piece is, of meat. It uh, is beef. And the, it's a tiny piece because it's for me. I need one, I need the perfect bite. It's for me. <laughs> I cannot teleport my food over to you. So, <laughs> and I'm not that hungry today, so it's fine. So tiny right. little piece. But the backstory is that tiny little piece is actually part of a bigger piece of meat. One second. <laughs> so what is he doing? One second. <laughs> We're waiting. This 
piece of this frozen oh piece of meat. Okay. That's and I cut it out of this and uh, had it sitting out there for a day so it would actually be soft and not frozen. Okay, back into the head with it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, by the way, in the meantime, I can just tell people um, if you want to ask questions, if you want to join the discussion, uh, you can either do it um, on Facebook with your friends. Wait, I'm, to... I'm talking. I'm talking. <laughs> but I need to close the freezer. The freezer is open. I can't get the meat in. One second. <laughs> Okay. So, so perfect. Um, so in the meantime, people can ask questions um, on yeah. Slido. Slido. It's uh, our event code is two six seven zero seven. And uh, looking forward to uh, your questions, guys out there. Um, ask anything to Johannes because he has an answer for everything. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So how are you going to prepare the meat? Okay. So first of all, the important story behind the meat is that's why i showed you this like big chunk of frozen meat that big chunk of frozen meat uh is part of my last project because in november uh i shot a horror film and i had the room next door full of meat because a part of the film is actually pretty gory splatter <laughs> and that piece of meat that you saw was the meat that we used in that horror film scene <laughs> and I thought like it's just like it's just good goulash meat so why would I waste it and throw it away so we cleaned it so and Yasmin my girlfriend was really helpful with that so we cleaned it all <laughs> up and froze it uh, uh, in my freezer and then I extracted one little piece of the horror film meat for tonight and that's what I'm going to eat that's awesome <laughs> that's such an awesome story i'm looking yeah. forward to to your meat and uh, what i'm doing um i don't know whether that would go good with the meat but i it definitely goes really well with nerdiness i'm mm -hmm. going to i'm going to be preparing a white russian oh <laughs> so nice. all the all nice. the dudes out there you know that's the beverage that's going to be in my hand <laughs> Nice, yeah. Nice. So for that, you need um, a good vodka. I hope and you I... have a crazy Polish guy who became a Jew with a giant gun somewhere near you. Uh, but okay, <laughs> yeah. Well, there is the vodka. Um, then what you need is a Kalua. Uh huh. And then you need cream and some ice. The ice doesn't count as the ingredient. <laughs> it does not? Well, no. You I can... thought that water would be in here. Yeah. No, you, no, you're, no. Allowed to, you're allowed to use salt, oil, uh, pepper, and, uh, you know, so if we don't, we, we, we're not extremely strict. <laughs> okay. Three, three ingredients, I'm main sticking, ingredients. Of, exactly. I'm sticking to my three ingredients. Perfect. Yeah. That's awesome. But Johannes, let's talk about monochrome. How many films have you made thus far? Okay, so, um, <laughs> well, the backstory is that uh, at monochrome, we have made many, many, many films, uh, especially in the late 1990s and early 2000s, but they were all short films. So, uh, so we have been doing like film productions as part of monochrome for a long time. Just for you out there who don't know what monochrome is. So monochrome is an art and technology and theory collective that I founded in 1993. So a long, long, long time ago, I was 18 years old. And uh, because I was a very nerdy person and very much interested in nerd culture and science fiction and uh, lots of like uh, technology and all that stuff. And at the same time, I didn't know a lot of other people who were interested in that kind of stuff. So uh, I wanted to create a platform or a magazine first and an online presence where I could work together with other uh, interesting nerds and, and political activists and create something and uh, pretty much how we call it at Monochrome, 
we wanted to uh, to find the perfect weapon of mass distribution of an idea because, <laughs> because uh, we we think that that uh, nowadays if you want to tell a story if you want to convince people of something if you want to even teach people something people don't want to listen people people need to be tricked into wanting to listen to you mm -hmm. and of course you can do that with lots of interesting formats uh, and sometimes you make a magazine and sometimes you create a short film or feature film and sometimes you make a computer game so so at monochrome we have been pretty much like trying to use all kinds of different media even mm -hmm. musical and modern dance and all that stuff so we kind of tried it out but uh, in recent years to to answer your question in recent years like the last 10 years or so we have been more and more into the idea of creating feature films and uh, so so the answer is so far we created three feature films mm -hmm. one is a very low budget uh, post-apocalyptic comedy which also very much fits to the general theme of of March, May, uh, April, whatever, like the next year probably. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so that was very interesting because that was pretty much like we did that in five days for 5,000 mm -hmm. euros. So it was a very fast production. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I mean, we created it interestingly for ORF, the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation, and they aired it on the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation. Awesome. So which which was fine, yeah. And then uh, uh, my next two films were two documentaries. One mm -hmm. documentary was uh, about nerd culture, uh, about my personal uh, story is, as a nerd. Which but... is an absolute, which is as, absolute must see uh, because it's so hilarious and it's so funny yeah. and it, it feels so short, although it's two hours. Yeah. It's two hours, pretty, exactly yeah. two hours. It's called Trace Route. Yeah, it's a great, uh, great film. Yeah. You 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 find it on Pirate Bay. You you know, you can do it. Don't do Pirate uh, Bay. Do do and, <laughs> Yeah, well, you can actually if you go to Vimeo, if you Google for Trace Route, the official site is Vimeo, so you can actually buy it on Vimeo. But I know a ton of you out there will not buy it. You will <laughs> download it. But then you can actually PayPal me a couple of bucks, so that's also fine. <laughs> and uh, and the second the second documentary or essay documentary I did was called Glossary of Broken Dreams. Mm -hmm. I released that one in 2018, and it's uh, yeah it's a documentary about political culture, actually political terms, because there's a lot of debate out there about politics nowadays. Of mm -hmm. course, after Trump came into office even more than before and also with all the shifts in the Austrian government. So all the people on Facebook and wherever they are debating politics. And I kind of cringed all the time because they use big words. They use like capitalism and resistance and hmm. privacy and all that stuff. And uh, but then you kind of ask the simple question. So, OK, so you're against capitalism. So what is cap? Can you tell me what capitalism is? Mm. And most people say like, well, I don't like money. And that's not the end. No, this is a yeah. little bit reduction. By the way, uh, and, I mean, I'm yeah. done. This is my you're, question. You're done. You're done. <laughs> then I have probably to start cooking, I guess. <laughs> I, mean, I, I know. So this is too, the dream. And I just, you know, after it's like the, the measurements are one to one to one. So you have one, uh, uh, okay. you know, it's it's all equal and then you just slightly mix it and there you go for your white Russian. Uh, nice. You know you so, know Big Lebowski, right? I mean you I, I mean, of course I know Big course, Lebowski. Yeah, that's so. why I made a, that's why I made a Zobchek. Uh <laughs> Zobchek, by the way, is my favorite character, really like a Polish guy who converts to Judaism <laughs> and runs around with a gun. Uh, and like, Jesus Christ, what a great character. Um, so anyhow, so I have a little, I have a little pen with an egg. See, there's the egg. <laughs> That's I have a little pen. Lovely. And I will, I will put some coke into the little pen. Okay. Yes. Not too much, just enough. So I bought, like, I don't actually drink coke, at least the coke with sugar in it yeah. so i just like i don't know who the rest i, I don't know what to do with it but okay. yeah, <laughs> you can you, well you have lots of meat 
<laughs> well, I have then, okay, there's the pan and then there's the soy sauce. So I will put some soy sauce into the Coke that I put oh. into the little pan, yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay. Let me, let me so, check if we're already getting questions about your recipe. <laughs> yeah. There we go. And, and now, done. and now, no, no, it's not done. Now we have to, like, I have to show you what's going on here. There, there we go. There we go. There is the little thingy. And now we are simmering. We are having it simmer a little bit. Because what I'm pretty much doing is I'm creating, um, oops, look at that. <laughs> don't, don't burn that, the kitchen down. Well, I mean, um, I kind of have to burn it down because I have to caramel, caramelize it. So it's. Oh, uh, that's, okay. that's <laughs> can you can you speak at the same time? Oh yes, I can. Okay, I can. I can. I can <laughs> steer and I can talk. Excellent, um, Johannes. I mean, you guys were like doing fake news before fake news was a thing, uh, and I love that story. You have to just uh, briefly uh, talk about the story of you creating uh, this this artist character and sending him to uh brazil you gave away the whole you gave away the whole the whole joke <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay I'm really good at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so well the story is well i i let i let the thing it needs to sit here and cook anyways <laughs> because as you have imagined i need to create um a thick sauce that I can actually uh, fry the piece of meat in. Before before moving on with the um, with the um, question around the character, I mean, yeah. you must be like getting lots of material in this quarantine. How does a filmmaker go about uh, in a process uh, or in a situation like this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, of course, I'm kind of bummed out that I that I'm stuck in here and sitting on my ass the whole day. But uh, I mean, at least I am privileged enough to be able to work here when I'm at home. I mean, number one, there are many people out there who uh, who have way worse uh, living conditions than I have. Uh, that are people who have to work outside they have to go out there i mean i can like i'm very privileged that i'm not working at a spa having to sit at uh, at the cashier's desk and uh, and people are complaining to me about their their lives because everyone is frustrated and mm -hmm. the only place they can go to are the supermarkets and then they freak out there i mean yeah. just jesus christ i've seen weird shit happening at supermarkets the last couple the last couple of, of days i mean i've only been there like twice or three times in yeah. the last week or something but uh, are but you anyway. are you freaking out yourself no not really uh i have to say that that i mean what what can you do i mean at some point you have to be grown up enough to say i'm not an epidem epidemiologist i'm not a virologist i'm not a doctor although i look like one <laughs> and uh what, what i really believe is that there is an interesting form of anti-intellectualism going on because mm -hmm. i mean i pay taxes you know like i mean i would rather not do that because technically mm -hmm. i'm a marxist and i don't like the state and i don't like class structures and stuff like that i am forced to live in that way so i have pay paying my taxes yeah. and what i'm what i'm paying with my taxes among many other things is uh universities and people being educated and being doctors and studying what they have to do and being biologists and all that crap, you do that. Of course, that's what I pay for. And that's why I like elites. I'm not anti-elite. Yeah. Elite just means that some person has a better understanding of a certain concept than I have. I mean, yeah. I have a certain knowledge about art history and culture and, and technology and, and certain um, concepts. And I like when people ask me their, if they need advice from me and I gladly give it but if i want to know something about epidemiology i go and ask the guy who studied it and went although, to university although even there the there are although even there there are lots of different um, opinions right i mean there are experts and experts and 
sometimes you just get this feeling around, uh, you know, uh, which experts belong to what kind of, uh, you know, stakeholder society, and I then mean, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we we're, we're living in a capitalist society, uh, and there are certain power structures, and we cannot uh, like ignore those power structures. They they just exist. Uh, the only thing you can do is uh, like trying to analyze them, see them, see where there might be a conflict of interest or something like that. But uh, I mean, it's way better, I have to say. Yeah? It's way better uh, than the opposite. The opposite would be uh, just like, just because you have an opinion about something mm. doesn't mean that this is like the, the completely strange uh, uh, thing that some people have about the so-called like freedom of speech. I mean, <laughs> anyone can say anything. It's like that's not the big problem in the Western liberal mm. society. Of course, I can say, but whatever you're saying, I mean, it doesn't mean that it's not complete bullshit what you're saying. Of course, I mean, free speech is protecting bullshit to a certain degree, but at some point there has to be like a, there is a boundary, and <laughs> the boundary is well, I mean. Uh, you like shut the, up and listen to people who actually know what they're talking about. Yes. <laughs> or what, what I prefer to do is I like to jump into discussions and uh, like to listen when people are actually discussing with each other uh, who know about the subject. So mm -hmm. it's completely pointless for me to listen to someone in the supermarket debate uh, the the corona crisis and the genetics of the corona crisis yeah. uh, but but it's very helpful if you're part of certain uh, chat groups or news groups or or if you know people that you can actually simply ask or if you jump into discussions i've been mm -hmm. uh, part of a really interesting discussion between a couple of experts uh, recently in the us i was just like listening to them and just like and they were mm -hmm. they were debating they had different standpoints uh, they had different viewpoints on the mm. whole thing, but at least you had the idea of like there are two people who mm. know the subject and they are having a grown-up discussion about that. But if you were to <laughs> and, if you were to make a film about all of this, what what kind of material would would you find particularly uh, interesting? What kind of perspective you think uh, you you would mm. go about? Because I know that you kind of often. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're making a documentary, it looks like uh, you you take a perspective of a historian, uh, then you go you know deeper in certain terminology, uh, yep. like with the nerd culture film or like with the uh, glossary of broken dreams. Um, but if you're doing a comedy or if you're doing a feature film, a horror film, uh, you I, which mm -hmm. we haven't seen yet. Um, you probably take a different standpoint. If you were to make a movie about the current situation, what would it be? Well, I would probably, I mean, the current situation is just too big. It's, it's kind of like multifaceted. There are so many aspects to that. Uh, I mean, for example, an, an interesting story could be uh, the, the, the tragic story of the guy in China who discovered the virus and died uh, yeah. through it and the whole discussion about like was china too closed about the whole thing i mean the whole the whole debate about about freedom of speech and public debate and uh the debate about authority and i mean in a certain way i mean if you have like one of my favorite tv series ever is chernobyl it was, just came out last year it's like a wonderful wonderful five mm -hmm. Uh, episode uh, tragedy about like the, the the horribleness of like bureaucratic systems and people who try to pr protect their asses and stuff like that. I mean, you can take the same thing and tell the story about COVID and the, and 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 the starting point of of, of COVID in China. Actually, uh, we, of have course we have a question. Yeah, yeah. I, we, I, just, I just see a question. As an artist. What are you doing right now if you're not leaving home? What are you working on? Oh, what I'm working on is I'm, I'm still working on the meat film. Uh, so <laughs> because we, we shot the film in uh, November and December last year, but of course it's not edited yet. So we are still, uh, we're still uh, in the process of editing. I can do that at home or actually I'm 
Florian Hofer. And Florian Hofer is sitting at home at his computer and I'm sitting here at my computer. And we have Zoom, uh, Zoom chats where I pretty much look at his desktop and we edit the film together. So we can, mm -hmm. I can do that from home because that's just like computer work that also very well works on uh, 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 like in, in, uh, in a teleconference. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on that. And I'm also preparing the final thing that's missing from the horror film is the voice because you never ah. actually see you never see uh, the main character. The main character is pretty much only bits and pieces of a body. Oh. Uh, so like not a dead body, but it's, it's uh, you, <laughs> you, you see a guy doing experiments in his, in his little, little room where he tries to find out certain things uh, without doing too many spoilers. Is it, is it like uh, a real horror horror or horror? Film? It is, it is. It is, oh, it is pretty okay. gory. It is not only horror horror. It's a, I, I would call it a drama. It's it's a it's a drama film, but it's also very uh, horrifying at some point. I hope at least. I hope it is. So uh, and because you never see the main protagonist, the main protagonist is pretty much a voice, and so I have not recorded the voice of uh, of the main actor yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my plan, I wanted to. I, I should actually be in Los Angeles right now, record uh, the voice mm -hmm. with my actor there. But of course, I can't. Uh, and so I have the privilege of talking to you about it. <laughs> but at some point, I will hopefully either be able to go back to LA to record it with him together there, or the other possibilities, mm. I will record it, uh, uh, like he will go into an audio studio there and uh, I will be part in a yeah. Zoom meeting and uh, will be directing from over here and he will record his mm. voice in the, in, the, in the studio over there. So We, I have, mean, a, we some... have another question. Yeah. Uh, where are the nerds today? What is a nerd culture amongst young people? Oh, I mean, there is a lot of it. There's a lot of it. Uh, but it's a different, uh, there's a different connotation to it right now. Uh, I think what, what changed very much is the general perspective that people have on nerds. I think uh, young, young people uh, nowadays, I think there is, of course, still always a level of, of outsiderdom and, uh, and people like to do stuff online because they, they avoid social contacts and stuff like that. And uh, nowadays, I have to say that nerd culture still exists. I think it will exist forever, but I think it has lost a certain edge. I think uh, what's really important about nerd culture and in general about people who are a little bit different, like uh, I think you have to be a little bit of an outcast mm -hmm. to be fully able to, to step, a, step a step back and look at society and try to find out what's not working. Why is society treating me like that? Why am mm -hmm. I being uh, like outcast? Why, mm -hmm. why is there, where is this going on and that going on? So I think that there is an element of counterculture always in nerddom uh, mm -hmm. that is less and less, of course, nowadays, because mm -hmm. nowadays it's just like, I mean, I remember, I mean, just, just, just like 20 years ago. I mean, nowadays, the only thing that keeps Hollywood afloat is super superhero action films, like something extremely nerd culture -y. Like that's the, ah, mm -hmm. the, main, the most mainstream of mainstream you can think about. Mm -hmm. uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, I would have been happy uh, as a young nerd to see more like nerd mm -hmm. content uh, on the cinema or on television or something like that. At the same time, it gave me the edge to, to ask the question of like, if what I'm interested in does not exist, mm -hmm. I probably have to create it myself. And that we have is- a question. We have another yeah. question. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it more difficult to be creative if you have to work from home? <laughs> it's like, no, we've been in self-isolation for ages. As an artist, no. you <laughs> no, no. I, 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 at least not for me. I mean, it just yeah. depends on what kind of medium you're working and what 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 you're doing. But I mean, just no, no. not not for me. I mean, I have a long to do list, so I, I write down ideas every day, mm -hmm. and probably ninety percent of that stuff will never ever be made. Uh, I mean, like. 
friend of mine said like ideas are cheap like the, the, the mm. problem is of like realizing your idea that's that's where the tricky aspect starts where mm. do you get the money from to create a to create a project um uh is it technically possible to do it etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think the the step from the idea to the actual production mm. actual like like just like the, the giving birth the giving birth moment of art yeah. but what do you think about yeah. what do you think about this myth around actually to be able to be creative um you need to have constraints and one of those constraints is money because uh we we keep hearing this um we keep hearing this this you know uh story around uh or fairy tale around how poor people um, you know, how suffering artists, the, the, the ideology of the suffering artist fighting for his or her individual views uh, and never getting paid and, and you die and 200 years later the world will recognize what sort of a genius you were. <laughs> so what do, you, well, what do you think about these things? I, I, like, I, uh, um, no, I, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is itself a very privileged perspective. It's the privileged perspective of like, um, it's, it's, it's a very bourgeois perspective. And it's also, I mean, I have to say like- what Oh, because call, people like, don't want to pay for art? They tell you, well, talk you into the- <laughs> like, like, like as always, like if you, if, you have a, if you have a system that's based around privilege and privilege that's based around, you know, like capital and, and possibilities and, then you you of course you always do something you always in a certain way support artists either you're forced to do that because you're paying taxes and then the state pays for the artists or you are like the uh as we call it in german a mezinaten to whom you're kind of like you, you you're you, like you, a patron you you're a patron you know, you're, you're this, but that all all comes out of a certain privilege the privilege of being able to pay making money and paying taxes and also having money and being able to give it away. I mean, the art market is as horrible as any other market. I mean, I, I dare to say like the, the oil market is less scary than the art market because the art market <laughs> has like, art has one really interesting thing going on. And I have to say that what we call art, the concept of art nowadays is only 250 years old mm. before before the beginning of capitalism, before early capitalism in the late 1700s or early 1800s, uh, art was not art. Art is kind of like a co-product of the bourgeois revolution. Before that, it was called craft. Mm. Even someone like Michelangelo was not an artist. He was a, a very well-paid craft person. And there wasn't a big difference between someone painting a Jesus for a church and making a table that was both of those things were craftsmanship or craftswomanship, but mostly mm -hmm. craftsmanship back then. Yeah. So uh, the idea of art, this like supercharged like idea, a 19th century romantic idea of like the mm -hmm. suffering artist that gives everything for society to make society see the depth of the universe, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> that's all, that's all kind of like, just like, forget, so you're, forget not, you're, you're, you're telling me that you're not making movies to, for us, the horror movies to see the depth of the universe? <laughs> no, not really. No, I make it because <laughs> I like to make it. And I, I, I do it because I'm a storyteller. Of course, most yeah. of my films, including the, the horror film, have a political dimension. So I'm telling a story because I want to get a message across. And, uh, I can put that message into a horror film. I can put that message in a documentary or a computer game, wherever mm -hmm. I want to, whatever I think fits best. That's that's the story. So I yeah, mean, which you, which you really masterfully do. And I wonder whether you masterfully also can tell jokes. Now we have to oh, for the ratings. <laughs> I, I'm I'm really I'm one. They're like usually you see when people are not funny. When people are not funny, they know a million jokes by heart. You can tell that immediately. Yeah? Like there's this one guy, this one guy who knows like a hundred jokes and tells all of them when you go with him for dinner. Oh my God, horror, this horror, this horror. Well, horror. I, am, I am learning jokes every day, so I might become one of those people in a couple of weeks. <laughs> no, no, no. By the way, look, look at that. Look at that. It's actually really, it's looking nice. Yeah. Excellent. Anyway,
My joke. Uh, how many artists? How many performance artists? How many performance artists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Oh my god! <laughs> I, I don't know. I left. Oh. <laughs> okay. And it's true. That's a sad joke. My, 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 my <laughs> girlfriend, my girlfriend Jasmine Hangoff, she can never hear that joke because she's a performance artist. But no, no, she's doing actually great, great, great stuff. And, I know. And I, I've I know. done performances as well. But I mean, I've been there. I've been to that place where you're standing there and looking at a really horribly boring performance and you just like leave after 10 minutes. I've been there, yeah. And you never figure out. But, well, um, I mean, or you yeah. zone out. You totally zone out. Yeah, that's yeah, right. You zone that's out. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I have a joke too. Just one, one second. Um, I'm not sure I will be able to tell. You asked me a question and I have not answered yet. Uh, the whole story about our fake artist. Yes. Yet, uh, yeah. I'm yes. not even sure because like really telling that story would take like 15 minutes. But the basic story is we were invited uh, back in the early 2000s when uh, when the black and blue government came into power. So when the first the first conservative right wing government was formed in Austria, we were invited to be the Austrian artist at the Biennial in Sao Paulo. And we didn't want to represent Austria because we were just like, you know, like we're leftist wankers and we didn't want to represent the government. So we decided to create a fake artist and send that fake artist uh, as the Austrian official representative to the biennial. And nobody knew that because we controlled all the press releases and all that stuff. And all the newspapers were reporting about the fake artist as if he was real because nobody <laughs> double checked the facts nobody googled the name of the artist that's so that's hilarious. the story and yeah yeah and in in, in the end that's the, the the long story short there was a scandal at the biennial in sao paulo where a really poor guy the taiwanese artist the taiwanese national representative he almost got forced out of the biennial because uh China had intervened. China didn't like the idea that Taiwan has its own national representation there. And so we kind of helped uh, the Taiwanese artist uh, not being kicked out and actually getting his recognition. And, uh, but that, that's a long story as well. But in the end, what happened was that the Taiwanese, uh, the biggest Taiwanese newspaper reported about the incident. And, uh, and the headline was uh, Austrian artist Georg Paul Thoman, which is our fake artist, saves Taiwan. <laughs> so a country that should not exist. And, uh, and yes, it's still, I'm very proud of this. I'm very proud I of this I think it's really, it's, it's like an art, it's, it's a good art performance uh, where you would stay until the end because it's like a fake person who doesn't exist rescues a country which shouldn't exist. <laughs> exactly. so, that's yeah. really hilarious. That's that's super funny. Yeah. Um, so, so my joke, your joke. My joke. joke. My joke. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, this, is, this is for you, you're gonna like this. Um, what is the difference between a hippo and a zippo? <laughs> I'm, I'm giving up, I'm giving up. <laughs> I am already laughing because I think this is really funny. Um, a hippo is very heavy and the zippo is a little lighter. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that needs to get buried <laughs> forever. I never want to hear it again. No, I'm so, it's a real, it's a real, it's a real dad joke, isn't it? Is well, you think so? I, I don't like this actually. This is this is my kind of humor. This is why I laugh at your films too. So. Yeah. No, no, but I mean, just 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 to make, but basically, I bought that the very last day before the. The, the lockdown in Austria started because I have a little garden in the back there talking about privilege, little garden in uh, in Vienna. And I needed something to get rid of like some some tree stuff and I needed to, something that I could, but it's actually perfect. I think like if <laughs> Corona finally turns out into the zombie outbreak that we really deserve, then I'm, I'm <laughs> well, prepared. 
Uh, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. just said that uh, you know um, shops that sell munition and 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 uh, guns are essential to survive. So uh, besides the supermarkets, those are the only shops that are allowed to <laughs> be open, uh, and there is no more munition. So you know. Um, well, that says something about priorities in the culture. I have to say. <laughs> well, absolutely. And I'm, oh my God, you have like thousands of questions now. You have oh to answer God. a few. Yeah, you have to answer a few. Um, yeah, sure. What would make a performance interesting for you not to leave? <laughs> well, huh. I mean, I've, I actually, yeah, but but that that's the good question. I, it, it's the answer right there. It would be something that I am interested in. It's something yeah. that 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 probably I, like. I mean, I really like being surprised. I have to say, I'm I'm li like I I for example, I, I give you an example. Uh, there is uh, in the 19 in the 1960s and 1970s, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, debate about the Viennese actionists. The Viennese actionists, they did just like really out there performances like they <laughs> shat in like uh, college auditoriums in Austria and stuff like that. Of course, they were kind of part also of the student revolution back then. But uh, it was very important that that happened because that's that was the performance for its time. Mm. Austria was so conservative, so not really not Nazi, you know, like Austria never got really rid of its Nazi past and so conservative and Catholic that you did something like that. You sit in the college auditorium or you, you you walk on the street with red paint on your face and you get arrested and sent to jail. Nowadays, you can't be happy that someone takes a picture of that and three people like it on Facebook. So what <laughs> happened between the 1960s and nowadays? Well, now, you can, now you can get arrested for not wearing a mask. <laughs> maybe. You, maybe. Yeah, but, but that's the point. Oh. If society decides that there is a certain limit what you should not do, then society will react to that. Mm. If it's not tolerated that you walk in a supermarket and cough into people's faces, then there will be a strong reaction to that. Police will show up, whatever yeah. people will, will scream at you. There is a reaction here. Yeah? But the problem nowadays, most of the time with uh, that kind of history of performances like the Viennese action has actually started it, uh, it doesn't work anymore. I think mm. that that uh, just like I mean, you can't jackets. really, you can't really, no. you can't really create scandals anymore, right? It's, you it's, cannot it's, create yeah. scandals in that form anymore. Yeah. You can yeah. create scandals in art, but not with that specific formula of like um, of revolt and stuff like that. We did a performance um, some time ago where Questions. we actually made we made blood sausage out of our own blood. Uh, just to demonstrate that nobody gives a shit about that stuff anymore because making like taking your blood and making sausage out of it is way more uh, hardcore than anything the Viennese actionists ever did. But we never made it to the front page of a newspaper with that performance. And that was kind of like the point of the performance. That's nobody kind gives of a gross, shit about that yeah. yeah. It's really gross. And it's gross on a personal yeah. level. On a personal <laughs> level, it's gross, but not as a as a medium for a political message or mm. dissent, it doesn't work anymore that way, no. Okay, you have two more questions I'm going to ask you. You have to be shorter with the answers because my drink is almost over, which means that we have to close our uh, our live stream soon. Yeah, um, and I'll eat my meat. Shakespeare, yeah. well, this, this one could be short. Your favorite film tip for watching during quarantine? My favorite film? Oh my God. I, so honestly, I mean, I have to say, it's it's, it's kind of illegal, but I'm still saying it. I have a close group of friends that I am I'm, I'm curating three movies a day now since the quarantine started, oh. and I'm 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 sending them like a file mail link with three films every day that I really like, and so it's been like three films since the 16th of March. And I'm not running out of films. There are so many good films out there. Okay. But I mean, of course, if people ask me, I know where they want to go. They want to go to the whole like quarantine stuff. So first of all, the best film ever made about a virus outbreak is Contagion by, by Steve Soderbergh. It's uh -huh. just like the best film, like just like 
from the basic facts and it's mm. it's almost like a documentary very good and what i also really like about um, one of the best dystopian or post apocalyptic films i've ever seen uh depends on on the level of like how much money uh people had for it but i really like children of man children of man is mm. is an excellent film it's just like on so many levels just like children of man yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> but i also like just showed recently like when i sent it out my files i also pointed out to uh, a boy and his dog that is from 1976 okay. it was one of the first films uh, with don johnson the guy who became big with miami vice super young don johnson and his little dog called blood uh, on the way through the end times. And uh, he's actually telepathically uh, uh, talking to the dog. Mm -hmm. So it's this like super odd couple film, like this like young guy uh, actually... and this boy, uh, this dog <laughs> talking through their brainwaves. It's, it's, it's a funny, oh, so... weird film. You know, yeah. actually I just watched Contagion a couple of days ago and it got me kind of freak out a little. Um, but it's, well, it's it's kind of it's kind of a claustrophobic uh, film for these times. Okay, um, Shakespeare wrote King Lear during the plague. Do you feel under pressure now? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, interestingly, interestingly, I'm a little bit so. Okay, the story is I of course know many artists and filmmakers. A good friend of mine, Michael J. Epstein. He was our monochrome artist in residence two years ago in Vienna, but he lives in LA. And he wrote this funny Facebook post where he said, oh my God, 75 people wrote me emails if I would join their uh, quarantine contagion uh, like a, a film project because all the filmmakers are sitting at home, have nothing to do, maybe have a camera or an iPhone or something like yeah. that and want to do a film. There will be an endless, an endless outpouring of quarantine or people in the room <laughs> films going on in, in the next couple of months and, and years. Uh, the sad truth is, and I hope it will still stand for what it is, but the film I've been talking about uh, all the time, my horror film, my horror film with my little excellent- Yeah, when, is, it, when is your release nice date? little piece of meat. Look, it looks really delicious. No, 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 no. When Tell is the release date of your film? Uh, it's not finished yet. So, okay. I mean, it's hard to say, talk about release dates nowadays, but hopefully mm -hmm. like end of the year, or early next year. Okay. But the, sto but the story of the film is that a guy, the main protagonist, which you never see, uh, has a medical problem. And the medical problem is that he has a tinnitus. He has a ringing in his ears for three years before the plot of the film starts. And he is completely like enraged by it. I mean, he has a tinnitus, and he wants to get rid of it, but the doctors can't help him. Nobody can help him. His last uh, 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 a boyfriend left him, so uh, he's he's gay. But his boyfriend left him because his boyfriend couldn't deal with with uh, his infliction. So it's a kind of sad story about this guy. And this guy decides he wants to kind of like um, quarantine or or contain himself in his in his workroom, in his workbench room. And he wants to do experiments to find out what changes the noise in his brain. Oh. And because he, he, he realizes if he touches a bottle of soy sauce, for example, it changes the sound a little bit. So he tries to find out what in his surrounding is changing the sound and what, what's going on. So oh, he's, okay. he's there all alone in his room and experimenting with things and trying to find out what gives him his, uh, the ringing in his ears. And in the end, of course, it all turns sour and horrible and he, and he becomes incredibly uh, crazy. It's, a, it's very much, it's my take on Lovecraft. It's a very Lovecraftian <laughs> story. Yeah? Awesome. And, uh, and that film is just like one person in one room. And I hope uh, my film, and I shot that film and I wrote that film like uh, last year before Corona happened. I hope, I hope my film will not be like one of the many one guy in one room films. <laughs> Well, it's definitely not going to. Well, I, I'm not assuming that lots of people can sit in quarantine and then 
short horror films, uh, which is probably a different take on all of this. But Johannes, thank you so much. I hope your meat tastes delicious. Well, I'm trying you... it right now. I mean, I really have to try it now. <laughs> you enjoy your... <laughs> it is in the right... Lovely. You yeah. enjoy your meat and stay on the line for the after show party. And mm. uh, the rest of the folks, we have to say goodbye. Mm. And guys, thank you for joining me tonight. Tomorrow, I am going to have someone who actually can cook. Um, she is the most famous internet online cook in Germany who cooks for specialty recipes for uh, people with allergies. So um, her name is uh, Steffi, Steffi, Steffi um, uh, Grauer and uh, Kochtrotz. So she's going to be joining me tomorrow. And thank you for tuning in tonight. I'm hoping that you will be tuning in tomorrow. Now I'm going to be switching off the stream so you don't hear Johannes's voice from the behind. He has cockroaches. Oh my god, you have to see this. He has cockroaches. I have cockroach. I have five cockroaches <laughs> from Madagascar. Ask her if she can if she has a nice recipe for the cockroaches in case I'm running out of food here with, with my girlfriend who wants to cook them. We have to ask Steffi. Steffi, if you're here today, uh, do you have a recipe for cockroaches? Um, okay, good night, uh, stay free of cockroaches, and um, see you tomorrow at the Entrepreneur's Kitchen. Good night, guys. Bye-bye.